So let me begin by introducing the speakers for today. Uh, we have two speakers today. Both of them are uh, currently at uh, Tejasoft uh, Innovation, Innovation Private Limited. Uh, so we have uh, Raja Nagindra Kumar, who is the CEO and founder of Tejasoft. He also calls himself uh, a code doctor. So his passion is really uh, writing clean code, uh, practices of clean code. Uh, aspects of software engineering and building teams who appreciate uh, the process as well as the outcome of uh, building a product that has quality built into it. Uh, so that those are his passions. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things about uh, Raja Nagendra is that, uh, you know, in the year 2000, he proposed to Nokia something called Nagastra a way to secure banking transactions using mobile phones. So that was, uh, you know, at least uh, 10 years before, you know, OTPs became a common way of life for securing banking transactions. So that way he has been a visionary uh, from not only from uh, building software products, but also in, in terms of entire solutions, end-to-end -end solutions. Uh, he started his career in DRDO uh, as a scientist, and then he worked uh, in LG Soft as a senior team leader. Further on, he worked in uh, Satyam Infoway, Sun Microsystems. But it was in 2005 that he branched out and he started, uh, you know, Tejas uh, Soft Innovations Private Limited. So with that short introduction, uh, let's move on to let me move on to the other speaker, Naimesh. Uh, he is a graduate of uh, Jain University Bachelor of Technology, uh, Computer Science and Engineering. And even in his students' days, he worked in Tejasoft Innovations uh, as an intern. Today, he is uh, working full-time at Tejasoft as a DevOps engineer. Among his passions are information security, Web 3.0 and data science. He is also interested in technical content uh, writing which is very interesting because uh, that's what we do at Devopedia. So perhaps uh, Naimesh can consider, you know, contributing articles to Devopedia. Apart from that, technically, he is a well-versed Python programmer. Uh, so probably some of that uh, is required in, uh, in, in this particular uh, use case of infrastructure as code. So without further delay, uh, yeah, over to both the speakers. Uh, thank you, Arvind. Uh, uh, Naimesh, you can start. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tevin. That was a great introduction. So yeah, as discussed, we are going to give a small session on infrastructure as code, and mainly we'll be uh, using uh, Pulmni to give a small demo on how to create buckets and uh, other uh, automation testing. Yeah, next. Yeah, I think you've already given the introduction, so yeah, we'll go on. Next. So uh, starting off uh, the basics, what is IAC? So if IAC is just infrastructure as code, it has two keywords, infrastructure. So according to the uh, definition, I just Googled it. Infrastructure is the foundation or framework that supports a system or organization and code is a system of rules that could be understood by computer or software. So when we put these two together, uh, we can see on the left side, it's infrastructure as code. So basically it's the process of managing and provisioning computer data centers or servers through uh, machine readable files rather than physical hardware configuration or uh, any in, uh, uh, physical configuration. So in layman's terms, we can just put it as Infrastructure as code, it means to manage your IT infrastructure using configuration files or code. Yeah, next. Yeah, basically what we are trying to say that is, you know, if you keep it as a hardware, it is very, very difficult to scale it up. Because when you say you want to acquire a hardware, there's a lot of process involved. I mean, there's a lot of uh, enterprise uh, management thinking comes. But now, you know, once you make it as a software, it's so easy to, you know, scale it up. Yeah. So traditionally, uh, when we talk about IT infrastructure back in 2000 or even in 2010, 
So any company would have their own IT infrastructure, uh, which would require routers, servers, network switches, and to manage all this hardware, we would also require uh, an operations team. So the company would also have to hire a cloud architect, business architect, IT operator. So uh, it the, uh, when it comes to cloud, uh, which is uh, what a lot of companies these days are taking up, this was a lot more complicated and a lot more costlier. Yeah, next. Yeah, so this because of these traditional issues which are related to hardware and then people to manage. Uh, that's where you see that, you know, there is some evolution has happened where, you know, uh, when IT traditional IT was so complex, people were saying, you know, yeah, I want to get rid of admins. I don't want to see any IT. And that's where Amazon was able to talk about, you know, DevOps. However, yeah, so the way they started uh, talking DevOps internally is uh, you ha can have virtual machine rather than a physical machine. And to configure that virtual machine, you know, yeah, they actually proposed a configuration approach using YAML. Uh, these days, even JSON is there. Uh, but unfortunately, what happened was, yeah, so though we converted hardware into software as VMs, it was still bulkier. It is a lot of still effort on configuring and then people got uh, very fast uh, sick of YAMLs. And then they wanted a lighter VMs. That's where they moved to Docker. And Docker also has got a Docker file, which is another configuration. So then they also wanted to get rid of Docker. So now the serverless has come. But if after all these, you know, you have, uh, converting hardware into software also has seen that evolution from VM, which is looks like a machine, but it is still heavy. Docker, which is lighter than VM, but still it is heavy. And then serverless, it is actually a virtual machine, but yeah, people uh, accept it as the lightest way of uh, getting things done. But unfortunately, what happened is, you know, managing even too many serverless has become a pain. And that's where, you know, people are now thinking about, you know, how, why not I make uh, hardware into not just the software, but I can make it as a code rather than configuration file. That way they can actually make everybody start using uh, a, a lot of known techniques of, you know, how to manage a large code as a part of uh, operations, dev operation, developer operations. Let us see some, you know, uh, drawbacks of uh, or some history around this and then see, you know, uh, we'll revisit IAC. Yeah, so like Nagin is talked about, there was a lot, there are a lot of problems with uh, previous or historical way of IT uh, infrastructure management. So people would physically put servers in place to configure them or uh, now we call them on prem. So some of the major problems uh, that we come across is cost. So the company not only has to build the IT infrastructure from ground, but they also have to hire the related uh, professionals. So they could operate and manage those servers. So this would all increase the cost in or by orders of magnitude. And the second part, second part of the problem is scalability and availability. Since the manual configuration is very slow, application will struggle with spikes in access. So whenever the company is looking to scale up their product or any app, they would require more infrastructure, which would require more uh, IT uh, professionals. So this is an exponential problem for uh, uh, any company looking to have their uh, looking to have servers on prem. Yeah, next. So the third problem is uh, monitoring. So when you have so many people working on so many uh, so many servers and so many so many networks, so many switches, it also becomes a problem to monitor. So if you if there is a problem occurring, you can't zero in on a problem. You have to trace back a huge set of uh, a huge network. So you can't uh, um, zero in on a problem immediately. So uh, having multiple devices would not be optimal when accessing any problem. So finally, uh, we have inconsistency. So again, humans were not perfect. We always make mistakes and there's always a, a communication gap between people. 
So when there are, when there are many people, uh, there is always discrepancies between uh, what is being done and what is to be done. So uh, these discrepancies are un unavoidable when it comes to uh, uh, IT infrastructure. Yeah. So to improve so, some of these problems, we have moved to cloud computing, which actually solved many of these steps. It was kind of a revolutionary because first problem was cost, uh, which has massively decreased. Now even startups can use cloud infrastructure instead of uh, creating their own uh, on-prem infrastructure, which would be uh, orders of magnitude uh, more expensive. But even though we have cloud infrastructure, we would still require people to manage this uh, infrastructure because we still have networking, storage, uh, virtualization of uh, OSs, data centers. So you still require people. So uh, you're still bound to get uh, discrepancies even in cloud computing. Next. So uh, this is where IAC comes in, uh, infrastructure as code. So it takes the existing cloud compute computing capabilities and takes it to the next level. So it pushes uh, cloud computer to its fullest potential. It frees, you know, developers and other professionals from manually uh, coding or manually uh, using configuration files and going through one by one configuration file and trying to see where the problem is or what to change. So without IAC, uh, we can see that infrastructure management can be disorganized and it's a very fragile process. So this way uh, it brings IAC brings more oversight and visibility to uh, manual uh, system administration. Uh, and this also gives uh, the coders a central repository. So if instead of going for a specific configuration file, we, ha we have the code all in one central repository. So uh, anyone or the team that is working on managing the uh, IT infrastructure can directly go to the central hub and uh, look for issues or any changes that has to be pushed. Yep. So uh, for in order for the uh, infrastructure as code to work, there are a few dependencies uh, the organization has to take into place. So uh, I broke it down into three parts here. So the first part is a remote accessible hosting. So the management tool, whatever uh, IAC tool you're using, needs to be able to connect and modify uh, on the remote uh, to the remote host. Uh, the second is a uh, configuration management platform. So the tool that is being used uh, should be able to automate tasks since you'll be managing uh, quite a lot of servers and a uh, lot of physical infrastructure. It's always important to automate your tasks. Uh, so you can create a set of uh, scripts or tools to help uh, to help out your team. And finally, uh, like I said before, there, there is a central repository. So whenever there are updates made, it's uh, important to have a very stringent version control system. So, for example, uh, previously we had YAML, but uh, YAML 2 people were sick of it and there were way too many configuration files and uh, having to manage all that is very difficult. So if you have a proper version control in place, then uh, it becomes much easier for the developers and uh, uh, operation specialists. Yeah, next. So uh, when you want to when implement ISC, there are two main ways to go about it. Declarative or functional, which is basically what should be the actual configuration of the target. Uh, then the second one is imperative, uh, imperative or procedural. So this is basically how the infrastructure can be changed when uh, uh, how the infrastructure should be changed to meet the desired result. So you can remember it has declarative as what and imperative as how. So in both of these approaches, uh, IAC could be a template and you can use this template uh, multiple times and uh, and you can uh, specify to your use case or uh, your uh, what, what requirement that is uh, uh, that your app needs. Yeah. 
So again, uh, the future, uh, the features of IAC. So we've talked about the problems. So first one it covers, uh, uh, which is beneficial is speed. So since you have tons of people working on tons of uh, infrastructure, having everything has a code would really be helpful because all you have to change is a, a single line of code. Single line of code, which, which is much, much more faster. And when you have Q, uh, staging QA and it goes to multiple iterations, everyone can have a look at the version control and know what is being updated and by whom. And again, consistency, even though uh, we make mistakes, like you said, we can find out the mistake as fast as possible. It's consistent. We can, uh, no matter where the discrepancies are, we can always find it. Uh, and uh, accountability. So we always know where the update has been pushed from or when it has been pushed from. Since everything is uh, controlled by one single repository, we can always have a log, log of what is being uh, done, which also improves uh, efficiency in the uh, software development lifecycle. So if we want to develop any application or uh, any organization fast, it's always good to be efficient. And IAC brings the best efficiency of uh, the previous uh, uh, traditional IT infrastructure. And finally, cost, we talked about how uh, we have to set up a lot of servers and also hire people and ma to manage those servers. So when, when it comes to costs, it uh, exponentially reduces because all you have to hire are developers which would, who would code uh, the uh, requirements for the IT infrastructure. Yeah. So uh, some of the IAC tools uh, previously used are, I think the oldest one is uh, CF Engine. Uh, almost 29 years ago, and the recent, the most recent one is Pulumi, which we'll be talking about today. It is written in TypeScript, Python, Go, and C. Yeah. So just a little bit about Pulumi. So Pulumi is uh, an open source infrastructure for full stack developers, cloud engineers, whoever it may be. Uh, you uh, Pulumi is uh, for them because it's not only uh, open source, it's also uh, language agnostic. So people don't have to worry about learning a whole new language just to use this tool. So it is available in Java, Python, whatever uh, language you're comfortable with, it comes in that language. So it's not just one thing, it's like an entire ecosystem. So yeah, at the most highest level, it has three parts about it. Uh, the SDKs, the CLI, and the service backend. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. As you were saying that, you know, yeah, Pulumi is a very new world, in, I mean, new world of IAC or new brand of IAC. Uh, one of the biggest challenge, you know, uh, not that, you know, IAC is not there without Pulumi. Uh, like uh, it was shown that you know there are so many places people have started try to solve uh, IAC uh, problems. Unfortunately, all of these people either they were declarative or they have their own language, and none of them had. I mean, uh, none of the uh, cloud provider you know was trying to focus on one area. But with Pulumi saying that, you know, I want to be a de facto standard. Now everybody cloud vendor is provide, it's supporting Pulumi. So that, you know, if you really learn, how, I mean, uh, other uh, concepts of Pulumi, irrespective of language you are in, you can actually become a cloud engineer in no time. You don't have to be Terraform certified. You don't have to be Ansible certified. Puppet, Chef, no, no, all of them will go away. So that's the real beauty of IAC. Uh, any questions so far? Hello. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, earlier you said people are sick of YAML. Right. Uh, as far as I remember, even this Ansible uh, files, the playbooks that we write, they are in YAML files. So would you consider Ansible still as IAC or it's something that came before IAC? Oh, it is one form of a declarative IAC, not imperative IAC. 
So it's okay to have YAML files and treat them as IAC. Yes, definitely. It is one. Yeah, it's a lower end IAC. Uh, but again, yeah, see the when the configuration becomes very huge, it is a pain. Right. Yeah. And you know, at the scale of you know, where people want to have hundreds and thousands of servers, it becomes a hell. Yeah. So yeah, the next version is I don't know, convert them as a code. The large scale code is more easier to maintain than large number of configuration files. They are not only large number of configuration files. Uh, configuration files are not as flexible as a code, which I can show you. And at the same time, configuration files if there are too many lines. I mean, a lot of IDs don't support it so well as a code. So that we know, I think trying to change configuration files is much more problematic. Thank you for that. So let me show you a simple hello world example. Your intention is to uh, make you feel that you know any developer can come on board with Pulumi in handling you know cloud resources. So this is one of the simple. Uh, the first thing is you know yeah you want to create uh, S3 buckets on AWS. It is as simple as this code. Yeah, maybe this code is in Java, but you can write in any language. It's I mean any standard language: Go, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, Node. So they give you SDK kind of environment where you know now cloud resources have become a library. Uh, the way Java guys know about how to make a network, you know how, how to make uh, threads, how to make processes, how to make UI. Now cloud also has become a library by itself. And as long as they know that you know cloud will have these resources, they can always and you know to create that resources, they have to create that object and then start giving those names. Exactly like you know now, let's say if I want to create a, um, a one bucket in a UI way or CLI way, somebody has to remember you know what are those command lines. And you know it becomes a learning curve, uh, but you know by the time it learns, you know the UI will start changing. Uh, so we would also when you say create a bucket, this manual approach. Now who will know? I mean, I think a yeah, good uh, DevOps guy can may like it, uh, but it is not a scalable solution. What is this tag? You know now there are so many screens, advanced settings. So that way, yeah, you can create once, but what happens, you know, if you want to change that, like, and either you can create manually, either you can create with the CLI, or you can create a YAML file. But then, you know, all of them, you know, are not perfect, right? Over a period of time, you try to say, well, I want a bucket with so and so size. I want, you know, hundreds of buckets like this. I want buckets in this region, not in this region. Now you see if you see all this, you know, whatever either UI will be, you know, is a pain. CLI is another pain. YAML could be another pain. But the same thing, you know, when people um, again, as I said, you know, it's a definitely a different skill to come to a code level. But when you really see coders, they can definitely handle and put those conditions. All of them, if you want thousand, you know, you can always put thousand uh, bucket names and thousand will just get, get created with the for loop. And the same thing if you try to put it in a programmatic with a configuration file, see, then it, will, it is neither a configuration file, it is neither a program. So you are complicating the configuration because that is not the place to fit a programmatic logic. If somebody wants to fit it, they can. But you know, yeah, that's not the right place to fit that. And that way, you know, yeah, you can actually survive for some time, but you know, that's not a native place. So I'll just show you one. Yeah, the same example in uh, uh, you can see Pulumi how how uh, this code also is there in the uh, GitHub. I can share the link. You can just say Pulumi up. Then it will actually you can configure saying that you know whether it's a development or or you, know, you want to convert this resource as a development uh, uh, staging or production area. And then you know each configuration can have. See again, as I said, not that this doesn't have configuration, but it will be a minimal configuration. 
and you know yeah the beauty of this is you know you don't have to remember also right when you created something this program creates something and you know when you want to delete it you know you should when you then you should know you should remember what what you have conver- what you have really actually created if you do it in a manual way you continue to remember that oh i have created two you know two buckets you know one vpc is you know one security uh, firewall rules but once you make it as a program pulli me gives you a go- better way that you know you can also undo it so now if i just uh, refresh it you will see that you know all these buckets are created so that's where i said you know pulli me makes it standard for any developers to get on to cloud like the way you know when you really want to have a network library you must know something right there is some socket server socket like that they will also know that you know cloud has got resources and they are all like a library and then they have full control uh, the same thing you know if i want to create those 10 buckets it would have taken easily half an hour and i would have made a mistake also Uh, so far uh, is the difference coming out well compared to configurations ui and cli yes <laughs> you can see it's programmatically created exactly and then you know yeah you can always see it from you know pulimi also gives you a console uh, what is, all these gets recorded automatically if somebody wants to audit what each developer is doing he will be able to go back and see when it was created how many are created all the details also give, you know given by the, uh, uh, is given by pulumi console which is also a central repository for entire team of an organization and it it looks like uh, that's what uh, naimesh was saying that you know you should have a central control otherwise the flexibility goes out of control leading to budget losses for big companies and i can always say delete a uh, pull me destroy the some bug with the latest version of pull me it is giving a uh, only second time it works it's also evolutionary technology but though it has see i have not written any code for deleting Uh, but automatically because it, uh, from this dashboard it know that you know what configurations were there and from there it will actually when you say destroy it will take that and then delete all those resources now if i say that yeah the delete event also would have come as 47 so you see that whatever i could see in the console it is there there is no chance of forgetting what happened because that's uh it's not about believing in tools but you should also be able to trace it back where you are and then they have I mean, there is an enterprise feature where you can add all your employees and then keep watching you know what is happening what are those uh, pitfalls the so same thing i can show you on azure so azure code is here i mean there's still you know again as i said you know uh, uh, the target is it uh, how to make, simplify it administration at scale and for that you know there were some bottlenecks like you know working with hardware that is broken it has become a software now once it became a software you still have to configure and you know yeah you can configure it it looks like you know yeah, previously people said javascript is so good right because anybody can write the code and which is true but when you say enterprise class you know when more code comes you know people started blaming the same javascript where they said it was easy but it is very difficult to write enterprise class uh, code and that's where typescript came in similarly in the devops area yeah the flexibility has come that you know one good uh, they have broken hardware into a software way and configuration is still not able to you know uh, scale them up and that's where they are going back to the old school why cannot i make everything as a code because one of the good thing is you know developers are there people are used to handling larger code 
and more especially ide tools are there very powerful enough which actually can make lot of flaws you know they can actually identify refactoring all that can actually take they can take the best advantages of ex existing uh, ides like that you know yeah it's a, it's one small concept you know which is taking so much of turns and phase and still you know people are trying to innovate but the logic is same how can i convert everything into code so that you know i can better manage better optimize so we have we have very good you know, yeah, directory structure i mean not, not all these examples are not ours it has come from various sources in uh, internet and mostly from uh, pulim itself gives lot of examples but however like uh, everything you know we do it in a cleaner way we try to make it more uh, easy to understand so like you know everything we related to java aws cloud examples are here uh, azure and gcp kubernetes so azure calls them as storage so you can actually uh, you can create a resource group you can create a storage account and then say yeah, boss create it export me done it gets uh, uh, i mean it will do everything required for you you don't have to struggle so much about you know what are the ui methods have to use or cli options have to use but again i'm not saying that you know it will not avoid code large code problems but it expected that you know developers will be able to handle it so it has created i can just go to browser and just to add on as to what nagin is saying is uh, there are developers with years of experience and they know how to code a uh, large uh, code bases and how to maintain it so if now with the rise of cloud uh, people also have to uh, gain cert certification for example in google you have cloud leader and you have amazon giving out certifications and uh, they have to spend time and resources to learn that and i'm not saying it's a bad thing but it takes up time and resources so instead of that they can focus on the skill which they already have which is developing and coding and then improve on that by uh, actually writing a code to uh, create our and maintain the uh, cloud infrastructure yeah. so yeah this is the one which got created i can delete it it will go away the same delete you know yeah if you really want to use cli yeah, people can become master saying that you know this is what uh, use this uh, command with this option but you know that's not something you know we should appreciate uh, when you really want to scale a product to millions and billions of dollars so that way you know little investment on you know uh, good practices of automation can really save huge uh, effort and cost to the companies Gone. Yeah, it took some time. Uh, so, which means you know, command has happened. UI is taking so much time to get it updated, but the command has happened. so like that you know yeah it is not that see once we said it is mode of a code there is now the standard coding thing starts coming in so it is not only about how to write how to create resources how to make sure that you know i am using the best practices of the code but there is one more very standard thing is you know we should know how to refactor it you should know how to do unit testing and that's where pulumi also excels where it gives you way to right unit test uh, i actually at uh, gcp thing and you know, i have some problem with gcp that's i um, mean i think when we started it simply billing it without knowing so we removed that uh, example but 
there is an example code in, in the version control for sure. So did hello world is uh, clear enough uh, how uh, what it means by IAC with Pulimi? Yeah, it's clear to me. I have one question though on what happens under the hood. So when you, uh, you are using this SDK and APIs through the SDK, does it use the CLI in the under the hood to say contact GCP or Azure or AWS? See each of these cloud providers, they have a CLI or API. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah, so basically, yeah, because Pulumi is pushing for optimum approach, yeah, I mean, they started with using internally Terraform. Okay. Uh, but Terraform internally for, yeah, they were using, you know, cloud formation and uh, CDK. So that way, Pulumi initially was using Terraform. Terraform was using, I think, HTTP API, uh, there are, I think, uh, uh, AWS have got four or five ways to handle this. One is they started with HTTP API, then REST API, then cloud formation, then CDK, and there is also SDK. There are almost five ways of handling it. But Pulumi was using Terraform and Terraform was using, I think it is internally using cloud, cloud formation. That's what I understand. Maybe I can verify it. That, but it is a hard route, right? Though we are saying it is a code, it has to go through so many layers. Yeah. That way performance is still bad. And that's where now Pulumi is stupid, uh, look, uh, now asking cloud providers to provide cloud control API. And that is what there is a traction that area where they call it as AWX. So where they're trying to say directly, you know, as low as possible, so that from Pulumi directly goes to cloud control API. Uh, rather than, you know, yeah, like you said, you know, yeah, if you go through CLI, CLI will use SDK and SDK will again use HTTP uh, REST endpoints and then it was impacted. But Pulumi has various ways. Yes, yeah, if somebody wants to use CLI approach, there are different packages. But currently after five years of Pulumi, they are actually trying to encourage through cloud control API, which every cloud provider is agreeing to give that option. Right. Of course, a related question here is that how quickly Pulumi adapts to a new API. For example, uh, let's say last week AWS uh, for their S3, they introduced one more parameter. You showed uh, so many parameters con configuration. Right. Right. Maybe last week they introduced one more parameter. Now the question for developers will be how quickly this parameter will become available through Pulumi. Exactly. And you're right, actually. This is always a problem one way, one side, because Pulumi is a, a mediator. And, you know, these end people, they actually, yeah, there will be certain delay. But the way I can see their funding and the way they are reacting, they are on the job. They don't want to miss out this opportunity and there is they have become leaders in five years. The key point there is, you know, because they are not saying you learn another language. Mm. So that's where actually the stickiness and comfort for adopting comes in. And yes, you're right, you know, see, in fact, another competition is people can directly, you know, because even each cloud provider is giving their own SDK per language. Why, why should we go to Pulumi? Why not? You know, I can use AWS SDK or CDK. Google also has got their own SDK. They also support for every language. So, but yes, intention is to, I mean, I think, you know, uh, have an, like I showed you the centralized repository, right? Mm. The real problem with that approach is, you know, yeah, you have to get used to different, different commands, CLI commands, different, different, uh, uh, API patterns. Now, once you get introduced to Pulumi, yeah, maybe the packages are different, but the construct to create the resources are uniform. So that way, I think again, Pulumi is trying hard, but they have to go very far. 
but yeah if they can get that patterns right it is like a java has got you know like it to it to for java to communicate with different databases see previously people also can write directly using their own api for oracle or own api for you know, mysql but now these days they go with orm approach they go with jdbc approach so exactly you should look at pulumi like that where they are trying to say that you know yeah you don't have to worry you understand this much patterns it is your own language i will take care of all these guys and it is not just about aws uh, gcp and azure there are 100 other providers who are coming in they support uh, i mean tons of people i i may be sure if i have that link i can show you that you know how many uh, cloud providers they are trying to bring them on board but there is some effort going on to standardize this make developers life easy come you know companies efforts uh, are well utilized one more question i had was uh, see we looked at the example of s3 on aws and uh, storage on azure right now the code was very different the azure code looked many more lines compared to the uh, aws right. code for creating a s3 storage Maybe it's very product. particular because the storage is very different. Uh, but let's assume that I'm creating a container with exactly the same configuration on GCP uh, and Azure. Right. So, uh, uh, how much of the code can be reused? Let's say I've written the code to deploy a container on Azure. How much of that code can be reused uh, for GCP or AWS? Okay, that's a very good observation and very good question. Yes, you know, yeah, they, I, I told you right. Yeah, they have to standardize to a level where you know it should go to the level of JDBC. I only write for one cloud or one standard Pulumi cloud, and then that should take care of you know whether it is you know in the configuration. I say uh, go to Azure and then create, go to uh, AWS or you know it should it should actually give you that level of transparency. But now I think yeah, it is not at that stage. What you're right, you know, they're trying to write it per cloud using the cloud API, the corresponding cloud API, which is wrong. But there is a discussion going on. How do we abstract that? That you know, people write it for their standard, and then you know, the cloud becomes uh, you know the, I mean, the creation of resources becomes agnostic to which cloud you want to use. But yes, currently, yes, they are. They look like, you know, they're totally different and you have to understand all those libraries. But eventually they're trying to push towards a common way of creating resources across the cloud operators. Exactly like Hibernate, I don't know, ORM, you heard of ORM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're trying to bring out that abstraction. But yes, your observation is 100% true. They are not there. But they, this, but this, this will, it is easy for Pulumi to go there rather than GCP or AWS SDK to go there. Mm. Because it's a third party and then that's where the cloud control API I talked about. They are trying to push all the some certain standards of doing it. Yeah, just as an observation, I think it is in the nature of technology to evolve like this. First, they yeah. attack the specific uh, interfaces. And then they try to attempt, can we generalize it in some way? Exactly, exactly. Because yes, if you look at another instance uh, where, for example, uh, mobile app development, people were writing directly native apps in iOS, native apps in Android, and then there was also Windows. Then uh, things like Xamarin came, where you try to reuse the code in different platforms or even Flutter for, now, for that matter. You right. write once and then try to deploy it in different uh, pl platforms. So something right. like that might happen here. You are right, actually. Yeah. See, all all this will evolve. But I, but one point I can definitely tell you is that you know you are the first question what you asked that nothing could be faster than directly using the native API. Like you know you you the best thing you I think you also have that question. Where you know, yeah, if I want to go from Android uh, 12 to 13, all this Flutter and all you know, React Native will have some delay lag. But the native API can suddenly start using 13. Yeah. 
So that 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 uh, risk is there, but uh, like you said, you know that's the way it evolves. Uh, we need to see who wins, but it is a step forward. That's what I can say. But the evolution may take some time. That is my guess because all these cloud vendors they want uh, vendor locking. They will not. Right. If your product is using uh, S3 or let's say Dynamo DB. Then it will be more difficult for the application to my, uh, you know, migrate to another cloud platform. Right, you're right. Actually, yeah, everybody is playing their game, right? Their business game. But yeah, Pulumi is trying to. I, mean, I think yeah, it's when I said step forward. Yes, you know, the vendor lock-in is now. Uh, at least you know, we are not talking about AWS SDK. We are not talking about CDK. We are talking about Pulumi. So that way some breakage has happened. Yeah, still, you know, like you said, you know, yeah, if still, you know, Dynamo DB features, people start using it, you still are logging. So there are actually, the, I mean, you can create your own resources also. The good thing about Polymy is they give you a plugin mechanism where, you know, you don't have to worry about just, you know, yeah, AWS. Uh, that's what I said, you know, they're, they're using, you know, a lot of providers are there. So, for example, you are saying uh, if uh, DigitalOcean doesn't have something, DigitalOcean could create it. Exactly. Now you see this. Uh, these are all called packages approach. You see, anybody can kind of bring out, you know, their their own resource and then provide a plugin for Pluby. Like that, there are so many for Alibaba Cloud, JFrog. You see, every resource which they want to expose to the cloud, they have a plugin here. So yeah, some way they are trying to break it, but yet they're still not there. Uh, but yeah, some of those, you know, uh, business level, you know, uh, how you really want to make things happen uh, without hurting. You become very popular, then automatically, uh, you know, AWS have to say whatever pull me ask, I will give. Yeah, slightly off topic. Uh... In fact, uh, one of the things which I had in mind when I started Devopedia is Devopedia becomes the de facto platform for documentation. Right. So instead of uh, you know GCP putting out documentation uh, on GCP or in Google servers or uh, you know React developers writing uh, React uh, community uh, uh, releasing. Uh, uh, React documentation on react.org or react.com. Uh, the idea was everyone will put their documentation on Devopedia. Right. So uh, it's slightly off because it's uh, documentation related, but that is what I see happening with Pulumi. Instead of interfacing directly with the different parties, you do it through Pulu Pulumi as a central exactly. tool or whatever. Yeah. But that way, what happens? Every vendor now has some standard. The same problem with the developers you know, trying to learn everybody one to one. Developers are learning to pull me, and vendors are also comparing to pull me. That way, yeah. you know, it becomes a one on one problem rather than a one to many problem. Like you said, you know, yeah, if you want to become a documentation for every software in the world, you expose the API, and then they will start pushing it, you know, using that API. Right. And then, you know, who are you seeing, you know, they're not looking for where should I go for React Native documentation, where should I go for GCP? They'll just come to Devopedia. Uh, yeah, uh, if you have more slides or demos, you can share or others can start asking questions. I think I'll be, I think uh, the examples are there. I'm not, uh, no, I mean, people can look into it. Let me just take you to the slides if something more is there. So like that you have, you know, a unit test where you can actually verify whether resource is really created or not. And, you know, when you are before creating it, so you want to make sure that, you know, I don't want to, uh, I want to make sure, you know, my Kubernetes version has to be 1.23 and above. See, all this you cannot get it as a part of configuration. 
it is very difficult because you know they assume that you know yeah, this configuration will never be changed or it is always right but at a scale you have to suspect everything and that's what code gives you the flexibility and integration tests also yeah, if you want to make sure that you know two or three processes are integrated well so there also you can start writing uh, integration tests so yeah in this unit test you know it actually talks about you know server it should have a tag and it should not be you know uh, uh, using you know a custom engine names it should use an ami so it should not open port 22 so those kind of tests now you see that any configuration file can it do it a good language a good program can very easily do it that we know it is not that killing yaml yaml is meant for you know certain level of uh, job. But when the business requirements go beyond, you know, it has to, you know, it is not that, you know, now we should move away from YAML and come back to next level. So here also you can always, yeah, if you have said, you know, my EKS is supposed to be EK1, 1, 2, 3, it would have failed even before creating uh, EKS. It will say, boss, you know, yeah, your test says that, you know, it has to be 1.23. Developer one point two 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 uh, two three. So that we know, yeah, we have created all that. So we can see. Uh, uh, oh no, yeah, I think I have deleted it. Oh, it is running. Huh? Yeah, something is running. So that way, yeah, you can actually automate EKS also. Creation of EKS, you know, it's hundreds of steps. Uh, that's where people say it is complex but you make it i mean again i'm not saying that code is easy but it gives you better ways of handling the complexity and yes definitely you need a coder not a developer not a ops guy so yeah you just say go test it is actually uh, testing uh, whatever the integration tests So this is on GCP. And you also have a logging library where if you want to have a program, you know, they give you whether you want it as a warning, error, and it actually handles all of that. There's a lot more libraries. I think, yes, you know, coding is also not easy because even after five years, it has evolved only to some extent. But definitely, it is a good extent, but there is a long, long way to go. So this is the code we have where you can see all the code what is as a part of this. All the examples are here related to Go, Java, but, but don't, um, not that, you know, everything may work. Uh, but yeah, if you can help me, I can always fix that. You can always create a generate code, you know, default code using Pulimi new Java and then start modifying whatever the template comes out of it so a lot of uh, uh, things which we used are actually documented only developers can understand it's not meant for everybody i think yeah, we are done uh, thanks uh, rajendra for this one one thought I heard about a company called Nutanix. Do they also do something similar to this? I don't. I'm not able to recollect. Though I am looks name looks very familiar to me. What is that company name? Nutanix. N U T A. They claim to do similar things. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not the right person. I thought I, you would be the right person to. Try. No, I don't think Nutanix does all this. They are a hardware company, right? Or an OEM for cloud or something. Yeah, I know. I can create that hardware from any cloud provider. That's what they told. Any cloud provider, you can create a hardware, you can, you can manage it, you can delete it. 
Right, but they still are not open source, right? They are. They give you like they 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 say that you know I give you the hardware, you can actually move to any developer, any uh, cloud. Okay, yeah, that's so why I remember them as Wiki is open source. Netanix is not. Is that the difference? Right. right? Exactly, you're right. Okay, and that, they're open so they're closed source, and they I think they sell hardware. I think more than software. Okay. Okay, you can check it out. We can talk later. Maybe I, I think I know this company. I, somewhere I forgot. They're, they're there in Sajjapur Road. Yeah. That there. Okay. Well, it's good that you told me that you know, they're looking similar. Okay. Any other questions? Huh. Any other questions? Uh, I'm good. Thanks for the procession. It was useful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. If no other questions, I think uh, I would like to thank both the speakers uh, for that very short as but very clear uh, introduction to what Pulumi is and beyond Pulumi as giving a good introduction to infrastructure as code. So this will be quite useful for beginners who are just getting started in this space or who have been for a long time, uh, you know, grappling with the configuration files or, you know, GUIs. Uh, so it is uh, confusing. It is repetitive and you can't uh, recreate the same configuration consistently. So in that sense, Pulumi is going to be quite useful.